Good Wednesday morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. From the Ohio Agnet, the voice you know with the News You Trust studio, sponsored by the Grain Equipment Company, where innovation meets execution. I'm Joe Everett. We're currently 59 degrees out here at the farm, and looks like it's going to be a really nice day to get some things done before we get some chances of rain tomorrow, which will be definitely beneficial for these crops going into harvest. Now, taking a quick look at the calendar, powered by soy biodiesel, we'll be broadcasting from Bowling Green today for a preview of the national tractor pulls taking place August 15th through the 17th. Then Grow Next Gen brings agricultural science to the classroom. Learn more at grownextgen.org. Then visit the Dark County Fair August 16th through the 24th in Greenville, Ohio. Find the full schedule of events at darkcountyfair.com. Now let's take a look at some of your agricultural news headlines. While the Senate Ag Committee members Chuck Grassley, John Fetterman, and Joni Ernst are asking the USDA to improve its process for foreign-owned farmland disclosures. The letter follows alleged inaccuracies posted online by the Farm Service Agency under the Agricultural Foreign Investment Disclosure Act. It's essential for the USDA to ensure that the information published on its website is accurate and reliable, the senator says. Inaccurate information can have significant implications for various stakeholders and erodes public trust in the integrity of the reporting process. Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack says the current practice of the manual entry, including retyping of paper filed reports into FSA systems, can lead to the publication of problematic and inaccurate information. We've been told there have been instances where energy developers have been incorrectly identified as having ownership interest from sanctioned nations when, in reality, the investment behind the company originates from U.S. allies, says Vilsack. Now let's check in with Dale Menyo as he has information about the use of drone technology from New Way Ag. Joining me is Mike Yoder, and Mike, nice to have you back with New Way Ag. We talked a month or so ago about the drone technology and its capabilities. Give us an update, if you would. Are people accepting the technology? Might be a little tough given commodity prices, but are they accepting the technology? Absolutely. The technology is really changing how farmers are able to get not only cover crop down, but get herbicides and pesticides, insecticides sprayed on their crop. They are absolutely impressed with the technology. If somebody knows how to run the system and train properly, they have nothing uh, bad to say about the technology. Well, I think some are so curious about the technology to start with, just the idea that something that small can get out there. Yes, you got to refill it. Yes, you got to recharge it, but it can get the job done. Exactly. You know, you said it best. It's like, People think, right, you think drones, you think small, these can't get acres covered or it can't get a lot of product put out. That's not true. When you have your system set up properly, you do a lot of filling, you do a lot of battery swapping, but it can go out there on a good day with the new way ag trailer and cover easily 500 to 800 acres with one trailer set up. Really surprising what you can actually get done with these things. New Way Ag, and the new is N-U-W-A-Y ag.com. And I was impressed. I was out to a show the other day, and I was worried about maybe all of our customers were kind of competing. And reality is, you guys are all working together, three or four. The guys we were talking about with the drones were using your trailer. Your trailer, I think, is even being used some out of state with people that we've talked yeah. to. So the technology yep. is not only there with the drones. It's in how to set up a trailer to be efficient and get the job done. Mike Yoder, my guest from New Way Ag. Find out more at newwayag.com. Hey, thanks, Dale. Stay tuned. We'll be back to take a look at today's weather after this. Did you know soybeans' number one customer is animal agriculture? That includes Ohio's poultry farms. High-protein soy meal keeps poultry farms thriving. Nationally, Ohio ranks second for egg production and ninth for turkey farming. Plus, Ohio produces 526 million pounds of chicken annually. Now that's a lot of birds, and that's a lot of soybeans. Soybeans, feeding the industry that feeds us. Brought to you by the Ohio Soybean Checkoff. Hey, Ohio, exciting news coming to you from Ohio's Country Journal. Subscribe or renew your free subscription by September 20th of 2024, and you could win one of four 50-inch televisions. Ohio's Country Journal is free, but subscribers have to renew their subscriptions every three years to continue to receive it. Subscribe or renew to stay updated on all things Ohio, from agricultural insights to rural lifestyle. Don't miss out. Visit our website today at ocj.com slash renew. Now let's take a look at today's weather brought to you by Seed Consultants. Simply better performance online at seedconsultants.com. Here's the forecast. 
Dry weather for one more day in Ohio. Then we have some rain trying to come tomorrow. I'm Chief Meteorologist Ryan Martin. Let's take a look at that Ohio Ag weather update. Here's what's going on. Beautiful weather for your Wednesday. And we see it over all parts of the state. Sunshine, blue sky. It's a little warmer. And, hey, humidity values are going to creep up a little bit today. That's because we have a weather system building to our west. It puts rain showers in here as soon as tomorrow midday over parts of far western parts of Ohio. But in terms of the entire state seeing moisture, that's going to be overnight tomorrow night through Friday. Right now we're looking at a quarter to one and a half inches of rain with coverage at nearly 100% of Ohio initially. Low pressure then wants to park over Michigan and the Great Lakes. And so I think circulation around that low will keep us in an area where we can see on again, off again showers through the weekend, both Saturday and Sunday. I think we have to allow for pop-up activity. Probably not a lot, probably not a lot of moisture potential in terms of Maybe it's only a few hundreds to a few tenths. Coverage around 60% coverage for the weekend, but we cannot say that we're all clear or all dry. That happens next week, Monday, Tuesday. We have beautiful weather settling in. Less humid, less temperature in here, but Wednesday, Thursday, frontal boundary comes through, gives us another round of rain and thunderstorms. That one, less coverage, probably 60% coverage, quarter to three quarters of an inch. Behind that, we cool off for a day or two and then see significant warm air trying to surge up for the weekend of the 24th. 4th and 25th. That's a look at your forecast update. I'm meteorologist Ryan Martin. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Well, Ben Brown from the University of Missouri gives his ag economy outlook as to what could be ahead for farmers. So it's going to be tough. Uh, there's a couple of years here. I don't think this is surprising really to anybody. You know, we're looking at a tough financial outlook uh, the next couple of years. Uh, we've already started to see that hit some of the capital expenditures, right? Like equipment sales are down 20, 25% year over year, quarter, you know, compared to a quarter last year. We see farmers making those management decisions. Uh, and, and certainly that's impacting the, the, the total ag economy. Uh, when I think about what producers can do, it's, it's to be disciplined. It's, you know, to, to build those partnerships with people that are going to have your back during the good times and keep you disciplined during the good times, uh, the good times. And, uh, you know, and so that's that's where we're at. Right. We're coming out of a period like we haven't seen in a while. Um, and we're getting back to, to low margins, higher interest rates. Uh, it's not a pretty picture, but hopefully, hopefully there's there's opportunities for producers to, to make some some money at different points over the next couple of years and, and help shore up some some financial statements. That was Ben Brown from the University of Missouri. In other news, the USDA will test the muscle tissue of as many as 800 called dairy cows at the processing plants to see if there are any meat tests positive for the H5N1 avian influenza virus. There has not been any positive test of meat samples in the three different studies the USDA conducted earlier this spring. USDA announced the new meat inspections Tuesday as the FDA also reported the results of the latest testing of milk products. Tests conducted on 167 retail dairy products by the USDA Agriculture Research Service from June 18th through July 31st showed none of the dairy products had any live or viral H5N1 in them. The FDA continues to look at additional testing of the milk, and officials also stress that there is greater risk consuming non-pasteurized dairy products. In other news, the USDA's Farm Service Agency is making changes to its farm loan programs effective September 25, 2024. The changes, according to FSA Administrator Zach Ducheneau, are intended to increase opportunities for farmers and ranchers to be financially viable. Many goals with this new rule that we're rolling out, but not the least of which is to change mindsets about what can be when the terms of lending meet the actual needs of producers. All of the changes that you're going to see in this rule that was announced yesterday and is up for public comment today, effective September 25th, and the comments close on October 7th. All of these changes are supported by generations and careers of experience working with borrowers, both on the part of our staff and on the part of leadership and farm advocates and farmers all across the country. Ducheno says a lot of analysis has been done to determine which changes should be made. Our team has poured over hundreds of thousands of loans in our portfolio and really identified some things that FSA can should and with this rule will be doing better to support our producers and their economic viability in the countryside. One of the first places that we started in that analysis was in our farm operating portfolio. And there are some things that 
became evident as we contemplated how to roll out one of our other changes, the application fast track. When we get into loan servicing, we are almost always able to work things out. And in our primary loan servicing, we really open the book on flexibility in terms that work for the producer to help them meet their actual needs. But kind of got us to thinking, what if we did that at the beginning of the relationship? And what if we further demonstrated that when credit meets the actual needs of a producer, everybody's successful, programs are successful, everybody's profitable. The three most notable policy changes include establishing a new low interest installment set aside program for financially distressed borrowers, then providing all eligible loan applicants access to flexible repayment terms that can increase profitability and help build working capital reserves and savings, then reducing additional loan security requirements to enable borrowers to leverage equity. For more information, go to fafsa.usda.gov or stop at your local USDA FSA office. In other news, for the second consecutive year, Georgia farmer Alex Harold has set a new world record for soybean production. Earlier on Tuesday, he harvested a 2.5757 acre plot of irrigated soybeans averaging 218.2856 bushels per acre eclipsing the world record he set last year in 2023 by more than 11 bushels per acre. We'll be back to take a look at the grain market analysis and your overnight markets after this. It's time to cut costs. Your Maristem dealer has the keys. Unlock the NPK you already own with new, improved Excavator AMS powered by microbialized technology. Excavator AMS is the first and only all-in-one nutrient release and residue breakdown product with built-in nitrogen, surfactants, and water conditioner. Take cost out of your fertilizer and adjuvant spend down. Unlock nutrition faster with Excavator AMS. Learn more and find a dealer at maristemag.com. Always more bushels for less. It's now time for the Louis Dreyfus Grain Analysis, and that is brought to you by the Ohio Soybean Council and your soybean checkoff. Here's Ryan Martin. Grain markets lower on Tuesday, sharply lower in the soy complex. As we take a look back at yesterday's trading action, trying to get some kind of clue as to where the day is going to go today. Had 132,000 tons of beans sold to China on the flash reporting system, 137,000 tons of corn to Mexico. However... Just didn't really see that get to any kind of supportive move on the marketplace. Record large U.S. corn and soybean yields. Loss of 900,000 acres each of corn and wheat. Not enough to turn the nearby price trend around. U.S. and Paris wheat futures were back against their old lows yesterday. Russian fob spot prices are steady or were steady, while Ukraine is looking a little bit higher. Whether it be Ukraine wheat or corn, the values keep rising, which has taken the pressure off off of Russia to lower their offers to garner world demand. The whole point of this is that world prices of wheat are not declining. It's just the Board of Trade and Paris wheat markets that are being pressured by managed money selling in sympathy with the large U.S. row crops. So if you take anything away from this, say it's the wheat markets that might hold in. And actually for a time yesterday, we had spring wheat and the Kansas City wheat both trading in the green. Chicago wheat never really had a chance. The U.S. producer price index gained a tenth of a percentage point in July. That was below expectations. The PPI reading encouraged investors ahead of a more widely followed CPI index that comes out today. The U.S. dollar declined yesterday. S&P index was within 5% of its all-time high. Other than the flash reported sales, there were nothing out there on the demand side to get us excited. Soybeans are definitely in a downward slump. Down another 23 to 25 cents yesterday, closing at recent lows, and it feels like there's more to go. Big crop size and big carryouts are the main driver here. The yield, eh, you can see the yield, but those carryout numbers are substantial. I'm Ryan Martin. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Now let's take a look at your overnight markets, brought to you by Seed Consultants. Simply better performance online at seedconsultants.com. We've had a lot of down in the markets, and it looks like it's going to continue that way for the grains, starting with September corn, 376.5, down one and a quarter. December new crop corn, 396, down one and a quarter. August soybeans, 989, unchanged. November soybeans, 959.5, down three. September wheat, 526 and three quarters, down two. Looking at livestock from yesterday's close, August live cattle, 184, up 67 cents. October live cattle, 180, 75, up 72 cents. August lean hogs, 89.90, down 12 cents. October lean hogs, 72.85, down $1.47. September feeder cattle, 242.17, 
up two dollars and sixty-seven cents. October feeder cattle two thirty-nine ninety-two, up two dollars and twenty cents. Have a great day, everyone. I'm Joe Everett, and this is the Ohio Agnet.